Today we're conducting the CEO dialogue virtually. I'm at IMD in Lausanne, and my guest Stefan Larson is in New York, where he is the CEO of American fashion powerhouse PVH. Some of you may not know the name PVH. The company started in 1881 with very humble beginnings, mending and selling shirts for coal miners in Pennsylvania. Today, PVH is one of the world's largest fashion companies with over 7 billion in revenues, 33,000 employees, and of course, orders of magnitudes more of subcontractors and partners and operations across 40 countries. What you certainly know uh, is some of the brands of the PVH group, including Calvin Klein and Tommy Hilfiger. Prior to joining PVH, Stefan was CEO of Ralph Lauren, another iconic company in the fashion world. Before that, he served as the president of Old Navy, a division of Gap, where he helped to deliver 12 consecutive quarters of profitable growth. And yet earlier, Stefan had started his career at H&M, where he held multiple leadership roles over the years, was ultimately a member of the global leadership team, helped expand operations from 12 to 44 countries, and in the process, multiplying revenues almost sixfold from about 3 billion to about 17 billion. Stefan, a warm welcome to you, and many thanks for taking the time to be with us. Thank you, Jean-Francois. Thanks for taking the time. You have been quoted as saying that growing up, you, you kind of felt unfashionable uh, because you grew up in a small Swedish town that was apparently behind the curve in fashion trends. Now, what do you remember from your formative years and what led you to the world of fashion? I was definitely unfashionable. It was more than a feeling. It was a reality. What really formed me early on was both my parents um, are from a low-tech Silicon Valley type of entrepreneurial region in Sweden. So I grew up being very influenced by that. So I remember starting my own business when I was 11. But I, I reached out to a plant seed producer and put together an assortment of plant seeds in the spring. So after school, I took a box. I put my assortment together in the box and, and I biked around the neighborhood and sold plant seeds. And that, that's how I got started. That was very much uh, something that came from, from how I grew up and where my parents grew up. Then you spent 15 years at H&M, where you rose to the very top of the organization. So first question on this, what was the secret? What made you so successful at, at H&M? Maybe the two most important drivers had nothing to do with me. So the first one is the company worked as a startup or a very entrepreneurial growth company, even though it was fairly big. The chairman was always saying, H&M should always feel like we as a team fit in one hand. So I had the benefit of coming into a very entrepreneurial organization, then connecting to my background as an entrepreneur, it made me feel very much at home. And then the culture was such as the best idea won. So it didn't matter if you had spent six months or six years or 25 years, you were equally listened to. And, and then thirdly, what, what connects to me, I've always been very curious. I've always been very focused on um, how to create something with impact, obsessively focused on what creates impact. In every single role I've had, I always looked at what are we here to do? Really, really, really diving uh, deep and then simplifying and identifying those one, two, three things that matters and then plan it out and go after it. And you said it was a company where the best idea won. Uh, all of us who are listening to this today know that there are few companies like this. What helped this company, H&M, to, to at the time be able to say, you know, irrespective of title or politics, the best idea wins? Thinking back on that, to try to, to distill and understand, to replicate that, and I, I, I believe there are a few factors. One being um, it was a publicly traded company at the time as well, but it was family control. So there was a very strong um, leader, almost entrepreneurial founder type leader, and who had no other interest than the best possible 
work and who was very active, always challenging, always debating, and, and, and then had a very good feeling of creating leaders and, and picking leaders that live those values. And, and sometimes I, I look back because I, I see some of those leaders created enormous value. If I look at how we look at leadership today and assessing everybody and you know, trying to find the right leadership model, um, it's very far away from what created the greatness at H&M because the way the leadership recruiting was done at that time was if you were really good, you got you got given the opportunity to lead. Looking back, it's, 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 it's the combination of a very strong owner and an and entrepreneurial founder-like leader in combination with the ability to pick leaders who embodied that culture, who had the fearlessness of, of saying every day, we don't know, but eventually we'll, we'll find a way. Now, then you left H&M and you, you went to live in the U.S. and, and you took over Old Navy, a, a division of Gap. First, what led you to leave H&M and then why the U.S.? I spent 15 years being a part of the team growing H&M from 3 to 17 billion and 23% operating profit at the time. And I, I had this urge to lead. And at that time, the, the son of the chairman had become CEO. I worked next to him. I started realizing that if I want to lead a company by myself as the CEO or president, I have to replant myself. And then next to that, I always dreamt of America, always dreamt of the possibilities of building companies in America. So those two things intersected 15 years in. And then I took the leap of faith. The Old Navy was in a very tough situation. It was a turnaround and um, um, yes, much more work than what I had anticipated from the outside. But clearly something that if I wouldn't have made that decision, I wouldn't have had the experience and the career I've had so far. You were incredibly successful at Old Navy. One article that analyzed your success said, and I quote, using what he learned at H&M, he did a better job at supply and demand. Dot, dot, dot. He realized that people who want to buy cheap clothes still want to look good. What made you so successful at Old Navy? Yeah, first, first and foremost, I, I always see it as we were successful. My contribution to that, if I look back, was I've always led in a very systematic, repeatable way. When I come into something, whether it's a new role or new company, I create a fact base. I map out all the facts. So I create this shared understanding of here is where we are. If we know where we are, it's a pretty good starting point. Especially, it doesn't really matter if we are here, here, or here. If, and as long as you know where you are on the map, then you can set out the direction. We set the vision, and the vision was based on the original vision that I found in the archives uh, that very few had looked at for six, seven years prior when I came in. We mapped out the fact base, we set the vision, we set the value creating plan, and then we, we, we started coming together and executing around that. Um, and it sounds simple, it was not very simple. The biggest challenge was culturally. We set certain ground rules. Let's redefine failures to, to learnings and please, please, please learn new things, not the same thing twice. And, and then it became like we create a kind of a positive culture. We were able to create an, an environment and a culture that thrived in learning and outlearning the competition. One of the things that strikes me in what you said is, is you managed to shift the attitude from, let me explain to you why what I did was okay. So a more of a defensive attitude to, look, if it wasn't okay, as long as I'm learning from it, uh, let's let's progress. So something which was more forward looking. Yes. And that's also a learning I had coming from Scandinavian culture where you n n nobody walks into the office with a fear of being fired. You have to take the fear out by saying it's OK to make mistakes, just not the same over and over again. So then you left Old Navy to succeed Ralph Lauren as as the CEO of the Ralph Lauren Group. First, upon the announcement, I, I, I just happened to check this, upon the announcement that you were leading Gap to join Ralph Lauren, the Gap stock dropped 3%.
and the Ralph Lauren Corp stock went up 5%. Um, I, I guess one of the questions I, I ask myself is, is how does that feel and, and does that create pressure for yourself when you see the one you leave going down and the one you join going up? I've always looked at it as, um, as a sign of that there is belief in me as a leader, but from, from investors. I haven't been carried away. And I mean, people call me and say, do you realize how much value that was just created? And I, I haven't thought about it that way. I think about it as it's a positive sign as long as that, that happens, that there is trust and belief, and that is important. Then I just get down to, to business. Does it mean that when you look at the stock price, you are not as obsessed about it as some American CEOs sometimes are described as being? I'm, I'm obsessed with the stock price as an outcome uh, over time. I want to drive shareholder value over a, at least a five-year period. That's how I look at it. So I want to make sure that what we do today is building the foundation to win with the consumer and drive sustainable, profitable growth for the next three to five years. That's my perspective. So no, I'm, I'm not looking at the stock price from a, a date. I look at it, but I, I, there is so much outside our control. And I also have seen multiple examples of when CEOs or leadership teams become focused on the next quarter um, without having that long-term view. Right? Taking profitable, sustainable market share and that's what I'm obsessed with. And then over time, when we do that effectively and efficiently, the stock price will follow. So what I'm hearing is very clear strategic vision and perspective and very strong execution focus on the process on a daily basis. And I think what, what's really important is the mix, what you just said, with being very, very clear on directionally where are we going and which areas are we going to win and create value in. And then, and then a maniacal execution focus, like cutting through whatever needs to get cut through to execute. And that's the, that's the balance. Going back to Ralph Lauren, you stayed a bit less than two years there. Can you speak a little bit about, about these two years and what you, what you learned from this experience? Succeeding a, um, a, an iconic founder and creator like Ralph was, of course, um, a, an, an unbelievable opportunity and, and, and the learnings I had during those two years um, have, have been critical for me. Now, sometime later, you were approached to become the president of PVH, serving under another long-serving iconic CEO. Now, since then, you have become the CEO, but you were, I think, for about 18 months, uh, the president of PVH. How did you approach that new chapter? My approach to coming into PVH was, here is a company, one of the, to your point, one of the, the largest fashion groups in the world, 140 years old, 100 years traded on the New York Stock Exchange, the only apparel company on the New York Stock Exchange traded for 100 years. So there is this enormous legacy and strength, but there is also an enormous possibility to connect into the future. Why? Because what I saw in my journey was, the traditional barriers of entry in the fashion industry have come down. Anybody can start a fashion brand, but it's never been harder to cut through the noise and build the next Calvin Klein, Tommy Hilfiger, or Ralph Lauren, or Levi's, or Nike. So then I looked at PVH, and PVH, we have Tommy Hilfiger and Calvin Klein, two of the top six brands in the world of fashion. And if we can take this, leverage the scale and the resources behind those, and connect those to where the consumer is going closer than any time before, we have a fantastic opportunity. Coming back to your question, so how did I more practically approach it? Well, um, Manny Chirico, my predecessor, he built the company from one to $10 billion. So when I came in and we had a long-term transition, I took the opportunity to learn from him. So we worked side by side for the first six to nine months that we traveled the world and I basically did my learning journey, but within PVH, I created that fact base. And then I, 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 Manny and I got aligned on that fact base. And then I started building the, the, the plan for our next growth chapter. It's of course tricky because you're, you're, you're coming into somebody else's company. 
And yes, you are supposed to be the next CEO, but you are not when you come in. So I think it's similarly to coming into H&M right out of business school. You, you come into a team of experienced creatives and you can't take yourself too seriously, but you have to, your mindset is, I'm here to learn, I'm here to help out, I'm here to create value, I'm here to make you better. And, and that, that attitude has been helpful throughout my career. And I think that's the, the, the humility piece is important, but, but then using facts as the bridge from where we are to where you wanna go and taking the emotions out of it. What do you mean, taking the emotions out of it? I mean that uh, sometimes as leaders, we have a tendency to, and, and, and we are guided and we create value by our intuition. But what I found is that um, we all have our own set of superpowers or intuition. And if we speak directly from those intuitively, emotionally, it tends to be more difficult to get alignment. But if you put the facts on the table, it becomes less emotional. And then suddenly you can come into a company like I did when Manny, my, my predecessor, had, had built from, from one to 10 billion. Unbelievable job. But my job is to create the foundation for the next chapter. So uh, unavoidable, I had to say, Manny, from a fact-based perspective, here are all the strengths I see and here are all the opportunities. But if I, if I wouldn't have had that as a fact base, it would have been much more, um, much more tricky. That's what I mean. Now, 18 months later, uh, the CEO is promoted to the chairman of the board position. You become CEO and, and you have very clear and explicit goals. One of these clear priorities is, is speed. So you've said, for example, that the COVID crisis has shown us uh, why it's important to be fast and also how sometimes we can be even faster. But most organizations, at least the ones you know, I've, I've met over the years, are not always very fast. So in your experience, what are the obstacles to speed and, and how does one go about removing these obstacles to accelerate the pulse of the company? The only benefit from COVID that I see is that it pushed us as big companies to really redefine what's possible because the consumer went from one day to another because of COVID restrictions, stopped shopping in our stores, physical stores, 100%. So if you were to have done a, a business game with us and said, Stefan, the next chapter is 85% of your stores are gonna be closed for an unforeseeable future then I would have said, and the whole management team, Jean-Francois, it's not realistic, we are wasting our time. What, did, what happened? We, we more than doubled over the last 18 months, more than doubled our e-commerce uh, penetration. So we went from less than 10% to today over 25% penetration. So it, it, to me, again, it just showed that the power of focus and execution, and that there are so many layers of comfort in a big company and so many processes and so many routines that doesn't support winning with the consumer. So what, what I use the, the, the COVID crisis as, as an example, as a leader, when I work with my team, is just to say, again, what did we learn from this? We learned that we could move so much faster. So it, it's ridiculous the, 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 the speed that we had the, the e-commerce transformation. The consumer was way ahead of us. And we said, well, in five years we can. No, we did that in less than 12 months. Why? Because we had to. It became priority and, and not like a one of 42 priorities. It became priority because we needed to initially to survive as a company. So how do you keep those qualities in the absence of a major crisis? I believe that we can create a similar um, result by setting really ambitious goals and objectives. That's another reason you, you, you asked me what created the success at H&M, what created the success of Old Navy, what created the, 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 the refocus on, on Ralph. The, there is one common denominator, the clarity of direction and the clarity of objectives. Because if you set those 
suddenly you leave this incrementality mindset. If you ask me what I do on a daily basis, it's that mix between do we have the right direction, right objectives, and do we execute? Do we actually execute? Now, I'm, I'm curious, how do you think of the relationship between ESG-related activities and company performance? Do you see these two things as, as a trade-off or, or rather do you see them as increasingly mutually reinforcing? I often get this question and some leader starts with, here is why inclusion and diversity is good for the PNL. I don't start there. I start there because my values, who I am as a person, what kind of society I want to live in, what kind of team I want to contribute to. So that's why it's important to me. Then it is, of course, in the business we are in, our job is to um, reflect the, the, what the consumer uh, aspires to. When they dream of an aspirational Calvin or Tommy world, it's, 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 it, it is a world that is more sustainable, that is more responsible, that is more inclusive and diverse. So, so, so it, it, it has to be connected um, throughout uh, the organization. And that's one thing concretely that we are looking at on how we lead to get impact on ESG. Because even here, I'm obsessed with impact. And it's become increasingly important to me over the years. And, and I realized the responsibility we have as a company to have that positive impact. And, and then, yes, we are a business. But fortunately for us in our sector, those two things connect. And as the company CEO, you have to take public positions on ESG topics and you are ultimately accountable for the achievement of some objectives. But very concretely, there are a great many people located two, three, four levels uh, below you and, and located probably all over the world that are making a great many decisions that have ESG implications. So, how, how does one ensure that hundreds of people located halfway around the world, uh, three, four levels below, do the right thing on a daily basis? I believe the answer is um, perhaps slightly different than what most would expect. One, 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 one could easily go to, here are all the ways we control it. I would like to start with saying, here is our common values and we set that tone from the top and we lead that way and we hold leaders and ourselves and our leaders accountable and our teams. So we create an, a common understanding of why is this important and we create a culture of where you, anybody can raise their hand at any time and say, wait a minute, we said we were going to do this and what I'm seeing here is something different. And and, and then, of course, there is, a, there, there is a process and a structure for control and follow through. But I would say it starts with tone from the top, values through leadership, through setting objectives, and, and, and that really makes a difference. And then there is a control function in the end. But it doesn't start with control. If you look back over the last two or four weeks, let's take two weeks or a month, and can you give me one or two examples of either actions or, or words or, or things that I would have looked and I would have said, wow, Stefan is really serious about, about the environment, about society, about uh, uh, how ethical our suppliers are. Can you give me one or two examples of things that you either said or did? One area that I've been involved in over the last few weeks is our, ability, our, our focus on sustainable materials and sustainable products. And a very concrete example is in, in one of our businesses, we have been able to have over 70% of our products with some kind of sustainability component to it. And in another part of the business, we are far behind that. So I leaned in there and, and I, I, I wanted to have a conversation and I wanted to personally understand and I wanted to share that understanding, everybody to have that understanding on the management team of saying, how can we have 70% of the product sustainable and much less here? Yes, we can explain all, all the reasons why, again, like why we don't, but 
What would it take to get the whole company up to 70% plus in sustainable products? That's one example. We did a VPPA, which is um, um, we, we, we commit to buy sustainable electricity. We sign a contract, a commitment over a number of years to buy an output from a sustainable energy source. And that commitment enables that investment. And that is something that I've been leaning into. One of our board members have done that, this in the tech sector. So I personally called him when I heard it from our team that we had the opportunity to offset 40% of, of our footprint with this um, and its real impact. Then again, I get going. And then I call my board member and say, I heard you have done this for, for Google and Microsoft and do you mind leaning in with the team and pressure testing it in every way you can? Because I want to have a decision in two weeks. And he, he got really excited. He did it and we got the decision. And then, of course, my question is, why only 40 percent? Why can't we have 100 percent? That's another example of like it has to be tangible. It has to be real instead of speaking about being on conferences, speaking about sustainability in general. I want to land that we, we VPPA uh, and I want to do it in two weeks. And when we do it and I realize the benefit, I'm like, wait a minute here. We could offset 100 percent. Why aren't we doing that? So that, that, that's just two concrete examples. First, the fashion industry is pretty brutal and, and the public tastes can be fickle, fast changing. How do you ensure that you remain resilient, patient, compassionate? incredibly energetic all the time. How do you manage yourself? It's, it's, it's an ongoing uh, journey, Jean-Francois. It's an ongoing journey. I, I, I believe that over the years, I've become increasingly aware of what you just laid out as a, a really important part of being a CEO. Like, how do you stay in the game? How do you keep that energy? How do you take care of yourself as much as you take care of trying to take care of the company and the team. So family is important to me. I'm trying to, when I'm home, when I spend time with my wife and our three kids, I try to be completely present. And then, yes, I have to work almost every day, but I can, comp I, I can do it in a way that I'm not walking around in the kitchen with the family, with my AirPods on, speaking about business. When I'm there, I'm there. Then I've realized simple things like if I cut down on sleep uh, less than six hours per night, um, it's a very bad idea. It, it, it's not helpful. If I don't work out on a regular basis, it's a very bad idea. So, so I, I've started to become more, more and more conscious about and, and track myself and sense. It's like, wait, did this you know, what happened with my energy today? And then I look back and say, wait a minute here, I haven't slept well and, and, and I skipped working out because I wanted to push this thing in. And then I take a step back and correct. So it's less about not falling down. It's more about I become better at catching myself when I fall down and get back and, and take my well-being as serious as, 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 as I need to take it. My personal contribution is tied to, as, to, to the things you introduced, which is my ability to stay optimistic, my ability to, to drive, my ability to, to channel energy. So, but it's not about, at least not from my journey, when I speak with other leaders, it's not you're, you're living some kind of super uh, man or superwoman life. It's, it's not, no, it's about you just get better at catching when you fall. Right. One of the things we say sometimes at IMD is you cannot give the energy you don't have. And so managing your own energy indeed is, is critical. Stefan, you've come a long, long way since the Hunken School of Economics and, and Business Administration, where you studied some 25 years ago. Um, if you and I had been students there at the time, would I have known back then that you would become so successful? Was it always clear in your head or or in your colleagues' heads? Probably not. Um, it's because it's a yes and no. You could see at that time that I was I was studying full time. I was running two businesses. Super curious. Uh, when I went into something, it was all about the impact there as well. So um, 
so so I think part of what 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 made me effective and successful as a leader, you 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 can see part of that. But then coming back as well to the 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 environment and that I made the choice to join H and M based on I didn't fully know what they were doing. I didn't fully know them, but I bought into the culture, the vision, and 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 I was lucky to to get into an environment that gave me the opportunity to get into the fashion industry. And I, without knowing that part of my superpowers is to connect creative consumer facing visions with business engines. I, I, part of that is just luck and, and, and that I had, I came into a company that was entrepreneurial. I came into leaders that believed in me. That's also something really, really important. I had leaders that in the first five, six years of my career, really believed in me. They saw my hunger, they saw my ability to contribute, and they just, they just kept th throwing things at me, saying, try, try this. And then I, I, I contributed there. And then they said, well, why don't you try this? Help out here. And, and if I wouldn't have had the environment or the leaders in the first five years, I probably wouldn't have the career I've had so far. Let's assume that we were buddies then, we lose track of one another, and, and we find one another again 25 years later at, a, at a, um, uh, one of those uh, graduation anniversary weekends. What would I see in you today that wasn't there? So, so what superpower have you either developed or what uh, kryptonite have you managed to decrease? How are you different today than you were back then? So I believe I was uh, more intense then. I had less understanding of myself and, and how I contribute uh, the most to building something great with a team. So I, it's, I, I believe I pivoted a few years into my career. I realized I went from, I want to prove that I can do this to no, 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 that's not half as fun as getting a team around a vision and empower that team, create the foundation, the, the, the environment for that team. I believe you will probably find me 25 years now later, um, a little bit more humble, a little bit more listening, and, and much more interested in um, what's going on outside of me. I'm not in it for me. I'm in it to, to see how can I use what I've been given to contribute, to have, to create something great and have a maximize our positive impact. So that, 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 that's, that's my sense. And I think it, it, it's a 25 year continuous learning about myself and, and, and what's meaningful to me and how I can create a positive impact. That, that's, that goes way beyond me. And it sounds like it didn't just happen. It sounds like part of it was you're reflecting on it. Yes all the time for 25 years, all the time, continuously. Stefan, thank you very much for making the time to be with us. Thank you also for your candor and for your insights. We wish you all the very best in this new adventure. And of course, many of the folks who are listening or watching us are customers. And so we will also try in a modest way to contribute to your success. Thanks again and all the best. Thank you very much.